Soundwave Superior. Autobots Inferior. This video is sponsored by Surfshark, and this is a list of all the horrific deeds Soundwave has ever committed. But this is a list of all the good things Soundwave has done, both of which combined give us possibly the most interesting character ever seen in Transformers. <laughs> the eyes and ears of the Decepticon Emperor is undoubtedly one of the most badass bots in Transformers history and has undoubtedly committed some serious atrocities, but sometimes you can't help but wonder if there's a secret Autobot in there somewhere. So hit like on the video if you love Soundwave or love your mum or any other universal positives that vaguely apply to everyone. And let's look across the continuities at Soundwave, the Spymaster, the Telepath, the Scientist, the Loyal Soldier, the Teacher's Pet, the Hero, the Destroyer of Planets, the Lamppost, the Stamp, the Nightclub Owner. And we're going to answer that question that all Transformers fans have. What's it actually like in his chest cavity? Oh, don't pretend you've never wondered that. So where else would you start them with Gen 1? We're in the very first step. He jumped in to fight three Autobots on the Ark. Did pretty well against them. Proving not only how good a fighter he was, but also that he was willing to go against the odds if ordered to by Megatron. Megatron. A couple of episodes later, it was Soundwave who famously warned Megatron of Starscream trying to shoot him in the back. And later, he gave up his power chip rectifier to transfer all of his powers to Megatron so that he could get an advantage when fighting Optimus. And Megatron didn't even use them. He used Thundercracker's teleportation and whoever had this electric handshake, but none of Soundwave's abilities. I suppose telepathy doesn't really come in all that handy in a one-on-one, -on -one. although he could have like used it to foresee what Optimus was gonna do. Ah, whatever. Forcibly entered a guy's mind to steal an antimatter formula. Um, has this guy not been through enough? And helped construct an enormous device to collect energy from the sun, even though it would lead to the sun going supernova. Wouldn't that kill them too though? and worked on turning New York into new Cybertron. He didn't even complain when Megatron blasted the console he was working on in a fit of rage. He used his telepathic skills to figure out that King Nurgil was planning a backstab, and he cleaned up all the lovely ladies at this here disco, but then probably took them all as his slaves as he forced them to work in an Energon factory. In one amazing feat of concealment, he managed to hide himself inside an Autobot's body. Yeah, so when Einheide was in vehicle mode, um, he somehow managed to get inside his trunk. And what's even weirder is that Blaster was already in there and he didn't notice that Soundwave was right beside him. How did this happen? He didn't like it when Starscream wanted to force two Autobots to fight each other to the death and ran off to tell Megatron. I guess nobody told him what happens to snitches. Look, even the Autobots are like, wait, he's not going to snitch, is he? He launched this baseball player into space. Wow, Starscream actually bothered catching him. He started a nightclub called Dancitron in New York. The plan being to brainwash the clubbers with his sonic powers. But Blaster figured out what he was doing, crashed the party, and the two had a sonic duel. Until Blaster used the club's sound system to amp up his signals and won the fight. This was the first battle in what would become a long-running rivalry with Blaster, but he wasn't the first Autobot that Soundwave had a rivalry with. And I'm not going to tell you who the other one was right now because I've got a video on greatest rivalries in Transformers planned, and I'll go into that more then, so make sure you subscribe for that. He almost executed Starscream for treachery when he tried to use the Combaticons to usurp Megatron again. Then he invented a device to mess with the Earth's tides, which couldn't be done without Bruticus, so when Swindle needed some persuasion, he implanted his head full of explosives and then threatened to blow his head off. Of course, events of the 86 movie saw Optimus dead and Megatron fatally wounded. Weirdly enough, he voted to throw Megatron out of the window when Astro Train needed to Jesse and wait. And then he fought the Constructicons for leadership of the whole faction. What happened to the loyalty? I still function. Nope. I don't know what you're thinking. Maybe he didn't realize that Megatron wasn't dead, but he is standing right there when Starscream tosses him out. So he would have heard Megatron go, I still function. What a I don't know, overthinking it maybe. In a Japanese comic called The Battle of Stargate, the Autobots gave us Squishies the gifts of a teleportation device called the Trigger. But guess who was there to hack it and put it under the control of the cons? Like, this would have been hilarious. Like, if they can't figure out why people have randomly teleported to some laundrette in Ohio. But you know what? Nobody likes getting hacked. Whether it be by a spy master extraordinaire like Soundwave, or some teenager who just wants to steal your V-Bucks. Yeah, that actually happened to me. Either way, you might want to check out Surfshark. You already know how it works transforming your- Whoa! Oh, I'd never, I didn't even do that on purpose. Transforming your IP address and disguising. I did do that on purpose, but it wasn't as good. Like, you know, robots in disguise. Uh, disguising your location. Also, if you watch my channel, you probably watch a lot of sci-fi. But Surfshark can give you a few more options. Like, I saw that I can't get Inception or The Matrix in my country. What? 
Not happening. Nobody comes between me and mind-bending sci-fi classics. But switch your locations to the Netherlands and boom! You're in a dream inside a dream. Hold on, now I'm getting paranoid. I better check my totem. My totem is a hedgehog I found in the garden. If the hedgehog says, Bruh, you're in a dream, then you're probably still in a dream. You can get three months free by using this here QR code and it's a super easy way to support me and help me keep making these vids. If they ever come back. Right, on to the Headmasters, where he had a pretty brutal face-off with Blaster. Okay then, we'll find out who's gonna win. Uh, like he had his chest glass broken, his arm came flying off, and then his whole body exploded. This resulted in him being rebuilt by Scorponok with a new black body. Make him more, uh, tactical. And renamed Sound Blaster. Why would they fuse their names together like that? Isn't that confusing? Of course, Blaster was rebuilt too and called Twin Cast, sending everyone back to fucking square one. I'm just thankful they didn't name him Blast Wave to make things like super confusing. He played a role in enslaving Planet Beast and he blew up the entire planet of Mars. <laughs> Scorponok's orders, but you know, he didn't have to push that button, you know what I'm saying? Are we sure this is Mars? Looks more like the moon to me. He didn't blow up the wrong planet, did he? He got jealous when Scorponok brought in a new comms officer called Counterpunch, but luckily for him, he turned out to be an Autobot spy. He eavesdropped on the Autobots' comms as they traveled between planets and followed Daniel Witwicky and Highbrow to Pirate Planet, which was full of fucking pyramids. But he was blasted by Daniel Witwicky's, um, Nintendo light gun. I'm actually being serious, it was a video game toy that highbrow made into an actual weapon. But generally, this Sound Blaster incarnation of Soundwave just seemed to be a little bit less engaged with the cause, you know what I mean? Like, to me, he just seemed like it was just a job. And you know why? Because he was under the command of this guy, and not under the command of this guy. In what seemed like a bold move, he infiltrated an Autobot ship called the Maximus. I'm the best spy there is. But Ratbat was discovered, and then when they both escaped, Soundwave led the enemy straight to a Decepticon base. Not his finest moment, I think you'll agree. Yoi! Jesus Christ, did that guy just jump? Does he have a parachute? Or? No, he's like Master Chief, no full damage. Do you guys think my shoulders are too big? I mean, they do stop me getting through doors and shit, but they look cool, right? Guys? Anyway, he saved the box and probably the world, actually, by doing something that actually must have been pretty painful for him and putting aside his rivalry with Blaster to defeat the Martians in the Mars Attacks crossover. And he managed to reverse the effects of their shrink ray when Megatron got made. He nearly got away with the matrix of leadership once too. He eavesdropped on a secret conversation between Optimus and Ultra Magnus, found out the location of this thing, and would have had it all to himself had Hot Rod not happened to swing past, kicked some cassette butt ass. Question is though, what if Hot Rod hadn't found him? I mean, obviously he'd have run to Megatron like a good boy, but what if he would kept it? Soundwave Prime, anyone? Yeah. You know what? Get in the comments and let me know who you think would make the coolest Prime. I would love to see Grimlock Prime. Doesn't even have to be an Autobar. But back to Soundwave. In the very first issue of the Marvel comics, he was already assaulting innocents at a drive-in movie theater, then got distracted by Spider-Man. Literal f***ing Spider-Man. Then he installed a thermonuclear bomb for Shockwave to prevent any traitors turning on him. He duped this mope into bringing him into an aerospace assembly plant so he could take over the place and turn everyone into slaves and use them to create the Constructicons. He later took control of the cons after Megatron and Shockwave went MIA and managed to persuade the other cons that he would stay acting leader as opposed to Starscream who just wanted the power for himself. Then he managed to use a sonic lance to turn Sludge against Grimlock and both bots were left pretty worse for wear after they went at each other. Like I said at the start, he wasn't always loyal to Megatron in this continuity, but it wasn't really a betrayal on Soundwave's part. It was because Megatron went nuts. Yeah, he got increasingly paranoid and then I think tried to kill himself by blowing up this space bridge. But anyway, you see Soundwave here congratulating Shockwave on becoming leader. He earned yet more good karma when he defended Buenos Aires alongside Fortress Maximus against an amped version of Starscream. So Starscream managed to get his hands on something called the Underbase, which was a collection of knowledge so vast that it could, and I quote, wipe a planet of all life just by its mere proximity, or detonate a star upon impact. And they say knowledge is a good thing. How this works, I have no idea, but somehow Starscream absorbed a portion of this thing. Only a portion, but enough to give himself mega powers. And once the bots realized that they were only fighting each other as a distraction, they came together. And it was Soundwave and Fort Max that coordinated the defense of the city until the Screamer could be neutralized, no doubt saving hundreds of innocents. Well done, Soundwave. Anyway, the Marvel comics ended with Cybertron blowing up and Soundwave leaving with Bludgeon and the other cons. 
he once destroyed the offices of Marvel Comics. That's right, after there was a misprint or mistake of some kind in the previous issue, Soundwave popped up to beat an apology out of whoever it was that was at fault. After he got his apology, the whole building exploded and crumbled to the ground and Soundwave was like, Apology accepted, ace. He turned to the Autobots again in Marvel's UK future timeline, where he's a little naive and trusted the Quintesson. The race who held them as slaves for millennia, remember? The Quintesson clearly was leading them into a trap and Soundwave had to call in the Autobots for help. Mmm, touch humiliating. But as he said himself, both sides were a very effective force when singing to the same hymn sheet. But he also added that too much had happened throughout the course of the war to simply expect everything to be brushed under the carpet. That said, he had to put all differences aside again not long after the outbreak of what was known as the Time Wars. Basically, this trans-time dimensional portal opened up, Galvatron and Megatron joined forces, and bots from two different time periods had to join forces to fight him. Soundwave did let the Autobots go first in order to soften up the opposition, then ran away back to his own time. So, it's not actually that heroic on his part. Transformers Earth Force was kind of strange, and portrayed our guy at his backstabbiest. First, he helped launch a global warming satellite. It's not fossil fuels at all, it's actually the Decepticons. And then he turned out to be a double agent spying on Megatron for Shockwave. Megatron grew sus that was a traitor in the ranks, and guess who he assigned to find him? Yes, Soundwave. I mean, that's how much Megzi trusted him. And you know what? Soundwave even made it look like Wild Rider was the spy, and Megatron killed him. Wow. Then Soundwave teamed up with Starscream as Trader Bros, before deciding that Starscream should have a little accident. See what I mean? He was proper backstabby in this one. Okay, let's do the interlude and a quick question from one of my members. Nethmedi, one of my original, original OG subscribers, asks who my favorite Transformers YouTuber is. Well, I mainly watch people destroying ballistic dummies in all kinds of creative ways and stuff like... But of course, Chris McFeely pops up all the time when I'm researching vids, he does amazing content, and I came across Comedy in Cam's vid the other day where he ranked every single episode of Gen 1. It was like six hours long. Hats off to that guy. Anyway, hope that answered your question, buddy. Make sure you guys get in the comments and let me know which Transformers channels you follow. Onwards, forwards, and upwards, dear viewers, as Soundwave's loyalty to Megatron returned throughout pretty much all of the Gen 2 comics. He asked Megatron the question we've all been wondering, which is, why the hell does Megs keep Starscream around? A question that we will obviously deal with when the time comes for a Starscream spotlight vid. But for now, Megatron was just like, you know what, I'll deal with him later. Back to Soundwave, he made a device to siphon out the creation energies from the Matrix of Leadership and got to put it to use after Megs beat the living bejesus out of Prime, plan being to use the life juice to make a whole new Decepticon army. Regeneration 1 was another comic where Megatron was MIA and Soundwave had to command what was left. At that stage, less of an army, more of an insurgent militia. His rallying speech right here felt like he was putting an optimistic spin on what Megatron was trying to do, saying that the Transformers, with all of their abilities, had the responsibility to take care of the rest of the galaxy. And that's why they should be in charge. Pretty much every dictator everywhere says this kind of stuff. But it also seemed to me that this was Soundwave trying to keep the legacy and therefore the memory of Megatron alive. In a cold move, worthy of Shockwave actually, he killed the Sky Scorchers, his own men, to turn them into martyrs and, and motivate the rest of the troops against the Autobots. Then he used the skills with audio waves to avoid a series of booby traps and steal the matrix of leadership from the Hall of Science, and allowed Bludgeon to use its power to fuel his Blitz Engine drones. More on them in this vid. He reignited the hacking war with Blaster, yeah, basically the two tried to out-hack each other, before Soundwave was possessed by a Shadow Leech. In Transformers G.I. Joe, he helped Cobra take over most of Europe in World War II. I wonder what his alt mode was here. Gramophone, maybe. And then, he watched Megatron turn into Pikachu. He took on an organic mode in Hearts of Steel, and I guess, had to prize Rumble out of his chest in Little Formers. Basically, after all the other cassette bots were out, Rumble was enjoying the extra space, so refused to budge. In the Creo cartoon, he seemed to cheer on the Autobots. I mean, so did Skywarp, but, you know, Shockwave didn't. He must have been pretty disappointed when Megatron was kind of underwhelmed by the Christmas present he'd given him. He wasn't able to enjoy his picnic in peace, and then had his clones sold as music players to brainwash humans into slave using hypnotic music. He became a ghost in the Ghostbusters crossover. Yeah, settle what happens to do a it's over. The tech story Dark Cybertron gave us an interesting origin for the character. Basically, it started with a younger version of Soundwave opposing the evasion of Earth before Megatron cruelly ordered him to lead the front line. Then after one of the Joes exploded his melon, his brother Shockwave described him like this. I mean, 
me listen to this. Emotion was Soundwave's thing. Soundwave was the kind one with his sonorous musical voice and love of life, which were unfashionable and unbecoming a Decepticon killing machine. The only time Soundwave would lose that generous quality was when Shockwave would accuse him of reeking of Autobot. So he started out pretty much a good guy. So in this story, he and Shockwave were brothers. And after Soundwave's head was exploded by one of the Joes, Shockwave sent the cassette bots, who he referred to as his nephews, to Callus to get him reformatted and put back together. But after they used dark sciences and I think sort of black magic actually to bring him back, he came back incomplete with his beautiful singing voice replaced with his signature electrical monotone booming, you know the one. And that's how the sound wave that we know was born. Quite enjoyed this one for the fact that Shockwave was always criticizing his brother for being too flamboyant, for being too caring exactly. And then after this whole thing, he came back and he was exactly like Shockwave. And Shockwave kind of missed his old brother. Thought that was pretty good. Anyway, back on Earth, he grabbed a few of the Joes and shoved them in his chest cavity. Um, I don't know, it's just something about, like to me it would be like grabbing Stuart Little and shoving him down my underpants. And inside there, they were accosted by these giant steel tentacles, which does answer the question of what it's like in there, but also raises another. Why do so many of these bots have tentacles inside their bot bods? I would have thought pneumatics and gears and valves and stuff, but tentacles. Anyway, a joke called Flash managed to cut them out. Comic doesn't explain exactly how. Like, I guess Soundwave just allowed him to cut a huge circular hole in his chest. And they stuck an axe in Ravage's head and then exploded Soundwave's melon with the fucking hammer of dawn. Oh my God, he didn't want to invade you guys. Then they fused him together with Bumblebee, transforming him into this. <laughs> But I always thought of Soundwave as kind of the parent and the cassette bots as the kids, but IDW flipped that on its head for me as Soundwave was found and mentored by Ravage when he was living on the streets, driven to the brink of craziness by his telepathy, which he struggled to control. Along with Laserbeak and Buzzsaw, they lived together, became friends, and eventually Soundwave was refitted so that they could live in his chest. So at this stage, Megatron was fighting in the pits and in the middle of his equality drive, he was impressed how Soundwave treated his cassette bars. He gave Soundwave permission to read his mind and in it, he saw the genuine desire for all bots to be equal. And Soundwave was sold. He was given a cause and a purpose, something to live and to die for. Megatron gave him the task of assembling what would be the key players. First the Seekers, then Shockwave, who Soundwave instantly distrusted. He aided in the murder of the entire Senate and reformatted Senator Ratbat's spark into another of his cassette bars after pulling out his brain. At this stage, their movement was still fairly noble in nature, so you can at least understand why he did it. But as the years went on and the cons were pushed underground by Zeta Prime, more and more bad apples were attracted to join and they became more aggressive and militant. Soundwave would often express concern at the brutality that, say, Starscream would use. It, for example, in one case where Starscream was going to sacrifice the lives of his own men and Soundwave had to be persuaded to go along with the plan. Perhaps most importantly, he did go along with it though. Then there was Shockwave's plan to hack into subjects' dreams by subconsciously manipulating them into committing acts of terror. But Bumblebee, their first test subject, confronted him with the fact that the Decepticons were supposed to fight for the people. I guess that made Soundwave have some kind of realization because he swore to only recruit willing participants from then on. He found out about Zeta Prime's plan to drain innocent Cybertronians of their energy to fuel these things called Vampark Ribbons, which was like the weapons that the Omega Guardians used to use. Yeah, Zeta Prime just weren't right. Anyway, he presented his findings to Megatron, who then formed an alliance with Orion Pax to overthrow Zeta Prime. Later, he would organize a series of massacres, basically designed to push any neutrals to join a side. So yeah, bad karma points for that. And then he was part of a battle with Prowl on Junkion, which ultimately led to the destruction of the whole planet. Well, that's two planets he's destroyed. He got attacked by Mummy, then spent a couple of decades trapped in his alt mode before helping Megatron defeat the Autobot forces on Earth in what culminated in an all-out defensive called the Surge. Soundwave would detect any incoming human assets like jets and tanks, and using his hacking and broadcasting abilities would detonate their missiles and ordnance before they were even close to getting in the fight. That said though, he could have easily just detonated the airplanes and tanks, killing the people inside, but he didn't. He just blew up the missiles. He did send out his cassette bots though, which probably ripped through the infantry. That must have been horrific. He let out a sonic screech so loud all of the windows in a city block radius probably shattered when Rumble got foomed in the face by a bazooka. A wail of torment perhaps, somewhat akin to a kangaroo mother finding her the kangaroo baby has been hurt. What noises do kangaroos make? 
I imagine it like an angry sheep. Bah! Why kangaroos for this analogy? Well, it's the pouch thing, ladies and gentlemen. They keep their infants in pouches like Soundwave keeps them in his... Yeah, whatever. He looked on the verge of tears when Justice Tyrest's universal kill switch caused Rampage to go limp. And then in the ultimate example of loyalty versus logic, he fought Shockwave when he found out that Shockwave had betrayed the Decepticon cause and gone his own way. It was here in a place where Shockwave's mysterious or 14 had made it impossible for anyone to die. So the two ripped chunks out of each other. Like at one point, Shockwave had the upper hand and it was only Ravage jumping in front of his blast that saved Soundwave. Enraging Soundwave and making him envision blasting a whole battery of shoulder rockets through Shockwave's chest. But ultimately, he decided to leave it and tend to Ravage. He did say that one day he would have to kill Shockwave, but ultimately walked away. So this is my question to you. Who do you think wins this? It's really hard to say. My money would be on Shockwave though. When Shockwave tried to collapse all of everything into a black hole to fuel Cybertron, he tried to talk Megatron into continuing their current alliance with the Autobots, but it wasn't really him saying, I prefer the Autobots, let's go with them. He was phrasing it as these guys are a pretty useful means to an end, let's keep using them for a while to defeat Shockwave and his colossal dead Titan. But then, he, but he was completely disorientated and blindsided when Megatron changed sides to the Autobots altogether and declared that the future of Cybertron was Autobot. I mean, imagine how rocked, how devastated he must have been by this. I mean, it messed Shockwave up something proper and he wasn't nearly as invested in the cause as Soundwave was. I mean, look at his face in the aftermath, watching Megatron leaving him behind on the Autobot flagship nonetheless, and wearing the Autobot sigil. His face reminds me of Charlie's face when I get my jacket and my shoes on and then I have to tell her, you're not coming this time. And you know the heart is just breaking inside, oh my God. So Soundwave and the remaining Decepticons latched onto Galvatron. Remember, in this universe, Megatron and Galvatron were two separate characters, they were never the same. Galvatron asked him what he truly wanted, and Soundwave described the origins of the Decepticon dream, talking about how Megatron had become sidetracked with conquering, that Decepticonism in its purest form was peaceful, and that what he truly wanted was equality. And to me, this is the best glimpse yet into the mindset of this character. So Soundwave left with Galvatron and the remaining cons to Earth. He helped Galvatron locate Alpha Trion on Earth, all the while trying to stop him from killing everyone. He even told him off for teasing Skywarp once. Remember, Skywarp was stuck in this thing and strung up and unable to move, while the cons used his teleportation powers. Well, Galvatron was like, I don't have time to hang around like some people. And Sound Soundwave was like, Operation No Dad Jokes. He did threaten to kill a dog once. Well, at least that's how Thundercracker took it. But then Soundwave threw his hands up and said he was merely offering assistance. I guess in that kind of, if you've got a pest problem, then you take care of the pest problem. You know, what is there to think about kind of way. He created a post-war commune on a human-built space station for the Decepticons to take refuge on and christened it Sanctuary Station and opened the doors of this place to Autobots as well as Decepticons, including Cosmos, who initially resisted and shot him in the kisser. He showed his admiration for the majesty of elephants, often taking walks with them at sunrise. And even though he was still fundamentally uncomfortable with Optimus Prime, Soundwave would split his time working with the Autobots and helping the cons on Sanctuary Station. He would eventually completely turn against Galvatron, even shooting him in the back once, before watching Prime execute him after, yes, after Galvatron had surrendered. Yeah, he even ripped his head off. Prime had just monologued that no matter what happened, Galvatron would always be a warmonger and there would be no peace as long as he lived. And to be fair, he was right. But you can see how shocked Soundwave is here. The fact that Soundwave had murdered this bot called Horrible earlier in the timeline resurfaced, tarnishing his reputation and meaning that he had to step down as leader of the Decepticons. And of course, Starscream was only too glad to step into his shoes. Soundwave did really regret killing Horrible though. Like here he said, I've made mistakes. And that was one of them. It almost sounds like something Optimus would say. All the same, Soundwave was pivotal in the efforts to evacuate planet Elonia, saving not only millions of intelligent life forms, but also a whole ecosystem of animals and insect life too, which otherwise would have been devoured by Unicron. It's pretty amazing too. Like right here, he talks about how they managed to save two thirds of the life on Elonia. That wasn't good enough and how next time they had to do better. He and Rom unsuccessfully tried to convince the Maximals to turn on Unicron. Remember, these weren't the Maximals we knew from Beast Wars. They're the ones manipulated by Shockwave, who they thought was the prime of the beasts on X-Prime. Soundwave refused Starscream's plan to abandon all those left on Cybertron. Not only that, he broadcasted Starscream's words so that everyone could hear what kind of character they had as a leader. He had another huge burst of emotion upon finding out that his G.I. Joe buddy Mainframe had died before what I still think is one of the greatest moments in Transformers history, where he amplified the power of all the souls killed by Unicron, transferring them to Optimus so that he could beat Unicron's creator. 
at the cost of his own life. As his body crumbled to ash, his monotone voice uttered one final command, Operation Absolution. Meaning that if this was the price of forgiveness for all of the bad things that he'd done, then so be it. Fucking amazing. Buzzsaw would kill some poachers to honor his fallen friend. Yeah, it's what he would have wanted. But yeah, that about wraps up IDW's incarnation of the character. Are you still with me? I know these videos are kind of long. In the War for Cybertron trilogy, he spread one of Shockwave's viruses and managed to find the Autobots' Ark. And in Earthrise, he was again part of a truce between the cons and the Autobots before Dinobot shredded his cassette bots, then impaled him through his chest cavity, with Laserbeak still in there. He repaired Megatron's eye in Transformers vs Terminator, but he also set Ravage to claw Sarah Connor's eyes out, before the Decepticons were double-crossed by Starscream, and he was blasted by the T-800 and Sarah Connor, who shot him in the chest cavity so many times that it caught fire. He made friends with the ponies and watched as the cassette bots played nicely with them. Friendship superior. Before he found out that Pinkie Pie had gotten into his chest and then threw a pie in his face. He gave me a fucking hard time in Transformers Devastation. Head over to my gaming channel if you want to see me making a fool of myself there. And he was apparently written up as a member of the Decepticon Justice Division in Transformers Earth Wars and sometimes does the moonwalk as a victory pose. In Earthspark, he was a little different, you know, not only did they change his appearance, uh, although I did like his stealth bomber alt mode, they also changed his character in that this incarnation was pretty vindictive about Megs defecting to the Autobots. And he once said that back on Cybertron, he once ejected a cassette bot, and because he was so starved of Energon that it exploded. Can that happen? He set the cassette bots on Megatron while he took on B and OP by himself. and it took a combined force of OP, Megatron, and RC to capture him. But he would later join the fight against Earthspark's principal villain, Mandroid. Okay, let's do Cyberverse Soundwave. Hated by Shockwave, great mover, his ending was possibly the best moment of the whole series. A series where he attacked Bumblebee, defended a moon-based planet smasher that was poised to destroy Earth, blasting rack and ruin in the process. He mocked Starscream when the Seeker thought he'd managed to get command of the Decepticons. He gave Clobber the task of blowing up Shockwave's lab. Clobber, I have a job for you. To make sure he would get the title of Megatron's number two. And interestingly, he used impersonation, pretending to be a Quintesson scientist, Operation Identity Theft, to infiltrate this guy's lab. This guy went nuts when seeing Soundwave and showed off his collection of Soundwaves. Yeah, he'd been collecting them from across the multiverse. Anyway, on the flip side of this, he frequently cooperated with Hot Rod. He played some music to celebrate the signing of the Treaty of the Wall, which was a peace treaty that officially brought an end to the Great War, and then sacrificed his life to defeat the Night Invincible Super Soldier Tarn, which is a moment I've spoken about quite a few times on the channel. And then I will never stop talking about because what a legend. Animated's incarnation was literally created by Megatron with the intention of becoming Megatron's new body. He became self-aware before he could implement his plan though and developed the ability to control other robots with sound. When Megatron tried to get him to join the cons, he at first refused to do any harm to any fellow machine, but Megatron conned him into thinking that the Autobots were the evil ones and because they were just pawns of the evil humans, they shouldn't be counted as brothers. So he reluctantly agreed and set about converting all other bots. <laughs> that is until he was smashed to bits by Bulkhead. But that didn't kill him. Oh no, he was reassembled and managed to take over a whole line of toys before transporting the Autobots' minds into a virtual world and figuring out how to brainwash humans. Ordering them to destroy all techno-organics, he and Optimus had a riff off using Rat, Bat, and Laserbeak as their axes until Optimus was like, fuck this, and then just whipped out his axe. The movie incarnation of the character would say stuff like, No prisoners, only trophies. Which is 
a pretty big sign that they ain't got time for this conflicted character bullshit. With them putting forward his cold-blooded villain side, you know, with his only noble attribute being his loyalty to Megatron and to the Decepticon cause. I loved his satellite mode and his ability to fire Ravage down to the Earth's surface like a missile, plus infiltrating other satellites with all these tentacles, and he was able to handle the vast amounts of data that his systems would be flooded with. But it was in Dark of the Moon that he was in charge of coercing and blackmailing various human assets in both the US and the Soviet Union, into making it seem that further missions to the moon were too expensive, bringing a halt to the space race program and covering up the existence of the Ark. Anyway, he took on the alt mode of an AMG and got given to Rosie here as a present before executing Q and coming this close to killing Bumblebee before B turned his cranium to shards. He had a small cameo in the Bumblebee movie where it's supposed that he and Shockwave share power in the absence of Megatron. Wherever the hell he's meant to be. We'll ever find out. The movie comics went into the same events in a little bit more detail maybe. A little bit more on using Alice the Pretender. We used to chart the rise and growth of Sector 7 in the wake of the Ark crash landing on Earth. When Soundwave got back to Earth, he found that a human outfit had reformatted Ravage and were using him for their own purposes and had to watch Nest obliterate Alice before releasing the Bayverse versions of Rumble, Beastbox, and Ratbat. And at first I was like, hey, hold on, what's going on here? Obviously Beastbox is a monkey, he's always been a monkey, but I thought that maybe they'd made Ramhorn a Decepticon. But even more confusing than that, it looks like they've made Rumble a rhino for some reason. Later in the comics, you also see his robot mode, which opens up a whole other can of worms. Like, does Ravage have a robot mode? Does Scorponok have a robot mode? Oh my God, he does. Anyway, Soundwave killed the Autobot Breakaway and they managed to get Ravage's body back, allowing Soundwave access to his memories before Soundwave had to go up against Optimus and got a clear beatdown. Before realizing that they were doing exactly what these nefarious humans wanted them to do. Optimus took him into custody where the Autobots talked about what a fearsome reputation Soundwave had and then he was freed when Buzzsaw shot down his transport plane. But Ravage was overridden again by the nefarious humans and long story short, Soundwave ordered Buzzsaw to assist the Autobots to defeat them, showing that actually he is a little open to compromise. He ordered Ravage to kill Skids and Mudflap, might still chalk that up as a good deed, and then he tried to make them look like Decepticon spies, then beat the crap out of one of the ancient seekers called Ransack, and Starscream had to hold him back to stop him killing the scrawny bot, before he later ventured into the Bermuda Triangle, where he encountered a bunch of World War II era warships and fighter planes. Ghost ships, basically. A line Soundwave was awesome, pragmatic, precise, a little bit of a creepy lurker. This dude was apparently a gladiator just like Megatron was, which means that although he might seem slender, he should not be messed with. The Covenant of Primus book wrote him up as one of the original Council of Zeta Prime, where he would eventually take a vow of silence in protest to the Council's handling of a rust plague which decimated Cybertronian colonies. The Aligned novels described his gladiatorial background and how he was powerful enough to almost beat Megatron, which garnered Megatron's respect. In Transformers Prime, he told Shockwave to stop spark swapping Rumble and Frenzy, but on the other hand, he suggested letting Shockwave, uh, interrogate RC and Cliffjumper. He intercepted a message from the incoming Wheeljack, allowing Makeshift to impersonate the Wrecker, before Starscream and Knockout tried to persuade him to switch off Megzi's live support. Do you really think that was gonna work? Yeah, I reckon Prime Soundwave might have been the most loyal to Megatron. Anyway, this version of the character was ultimately banished to the Shadow Zone, a portal to which was opened when two ground bridges started feeding off each other. But then when Fixit accidentally opened another portal, guess who's back? He battered all of Team B before throwing Bumblebee himself into the dimension. And yeah, his tentacles are pretty strong. Look, he picks up Grimlock like he's nothing. Before later getting a new body and vehicle mode and revealing that he'd used his time in the Shadow Zone to build a transgalactic beacon generator to guess what? Bring back Megzi. Of course, Soundwave was eventually defeated and sent back to Cybertron to face trial. All right, you guys, I gotta leave that there for now. There's a few continuities I didn't get time for in this one, so I'll see how this video does, and if there's interest, I'll do a part two. As always, this channel is nothing without you guys, so thank you very much for coming with me on this journey. Thank you for all your support, and thanks to Surfshark for sponsoring. Say bye-bye, little hedgehog I found in the garden. Bye-bye. But also, bruh, you still- No!